Amen and amen. It's good to see you this morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in church. It's good to be in church. <laughs> Just in case. What a great day in the Lord. We're continuing a series of messages on God's glorious church. We'll get that in just a moment. But I do want to remind you that uh, where's the uh, PowerPoints up there? Get it for me up there. That this coming, not this coming Sunday, week after the, this coming Sunday, will be our Christmas Sunday morning services. We will be here on Sunday morning at 1045. We're going to do just a one-hour service. Hallelujah. But it's going to be a celebration service. And it's going to be an awesome service. You don't want to miss it. Uh, the nursery will be closed that morning. I'm still discussing with the children's church, but I'm sure as we can bring everybody in, family time, worship. And if you have a crying baby, we have a cry room. You can still hear and see everything. But uh, it's like just a, it's the length of service is a one-hour service. We'll try to get as many people who are usually serving us in different areas of ministries to be in the service with us, all right? So I know, I know you appreciate all those people who are constantly giving service to you like that, but uh, it's also good to let them know. Thank you, ma'am. What's that colored stuff in the top? Bubbles, huh? Should I or shouldn't I? I should. <laughs> Keep you guessing that way, amen? Coming to church this morning, uh, in fact, you know, with two services, leaving my home in Magnolia and coming through Magnolia and then driving over here. I tried to count, but I lost count as to how many donut shops I passed. <laughs> and they were packed out. In fact, their crowds were better than any church I passed. And they were getting in line and going around the way. You know, Saturday morning at my home for a long time was, uh, when my kids were growing up, was uh, Shipley's morning. We let Mama sleep in on Saturday. Okay. <laughs> so he lays a little slow there, amen? And I'd take the kids, and we'd go down to Old Town Spring, the Shipley's there, and we'd sit down and have coffee. I'd have coffee and donuts, and they'd have donuts and whatever else, orange juice and chocolate milk, whatever else they could get. But you know, they were, those were fun, fun mornings, going down there with the kids and sitting down and eating donuts. Nothing nutritional about it, nothing healthy about it, but they sure were good because if you got down there, they'd give you the hot ones, you know, uh, and they'd serve those hot donuts. And it's always fun watching the kids stare in the, glazed, stare in the glass window where they had all the donuts laid out, you know, and you see the chocolate covered and the cherry and the stuffed ones and the sprinkled ones, and, you know, always got to get something with sprinkles on it. Uh, just, you know, people love donuts. I mean, I, I just, I haven't figured out, I, I'd like to see somebody's record keeping as to how much money you can make on donuts. It must, it must be a lot because there's so many stinking donut shops. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess material-wise, you got two cents worth of stuff in it. You sell them for, what, 90 cents or something. I guess you're doing all right on the, the end market. There's not a lot of equipment you need, a fryer, some grease, and sugar, you know. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, one of my trips in evangelism, we were in Memphis doing revival, and uh pastor gave me my first introduction, this was a long time ago, to Krispy Kreme donuts. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not talking about the kind you buy at the gas station and been sitting there for two or three days, you know. I'm talking about Krispy Kreme fresh donuts. And I remember he says, you've got to see this place. And so I said, well, said, oh, it's a Krispy Kreme donut place here. You know, it's one of the, one of the first ones. And come on down, I'm going to show you this place. And then they've got, the, they've got it set up where you can watch the whole process from where they roll the donuts out and, you know, stick them on the things and dip them in the fryers and bring them up. And so I was all excited about going and eating some Krispy Kreme donuts. So we went down there early and watched the Krispy Kreme donut makers make their little magic, you know. It was amazing, you know, they had it all rolled out and the things would come out and drop in circles and, you know, press the holes out and they'd go down the line. And then they'd get to that vat of sugar and they would baptize them. <laughs> you never knew donuts were Baptist, did you? <laughs> And that hot, melted sugar. Mmm, you know, and you'd watch them come up out of that hot, melted sugar just from being fresh out of the fryer right into the sugar, you know, and they'd come up and they'd just drip off and they'd come down to the manufacturing line. And then you'd get in line right there where those donuts were coming out. And they'd give them to you just hot out of there and just melt in your mouth. Just, just delicious. Absolutely probably putting, like, poison in your system. But good, you know. I have discovered that a lot of people look for churches like that. And when we talk today in the glorious church, so I went to that lengthy little introduction is to show you that uh, just because it's bread doesn't mean it's living bread. Just because it may have, you know, a good flavor to it doesn't mean it's the right word. 
the glorious church which the Lord Jesus Christ died for and has put together in this great mystery we call the body of Christ was to be his bride. And one of the things about the bride is we've been given this proclamation to make to the world. And ultimately, the proclamation that God has given us to the world is the word of God. And the Word of God is one of the most important things that we can do as a church, whether we're reading it, we're sharing it, we're encouraging it, we're preaching it, standing on it. And you'll find out that a Believer's Fellowship, and we tell everybody this when they go through our Journey 101 class, is that everything we do at Believer's Fellowship has its foundation in the Word of God. And if it does not, then we really don't really be, need to be doing it. If it doesn't have something to do with preaching, proclaiming, helping, ministering, reaching out with the Word of God. Everything we do finds us finds its foundation and finds its premise in the Word of God. What we're about to proclaim to you this morning is the Word of God. What we proclaim week in and week out, what we preach is the Word of God. In fact, the Bible makes it pretty clear concerning the proclamation that we do have. It makes it very simple, very outlined, very clearly and very concisely that the Bible is what the proclamation is all about. It's but that's the heart of what we're here for. It's the Word of God that we preach to people. It's the Word of God that not only we preach, that, we make, that makes a difference. When you look at the church, and we've been going through this whole study on the church, you, one of the best places to go when you see the ministries and the work and the, and the function and the government, the, the organization of a New Testament church, the way that it should be founded and the way that it should be established is found in those, those, those epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy and to Titus. In fact, they're called the pastoral epistles so that these young preachers would know exactly what God wanted them to do in this new marvelous thing called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. In 2 Timothy chapters 3 and chapter 4, you see a lot of these things, but the heart of it's right here about our proclamation. He says, I solemnly charge you. And by the way, listen to the way this is laid out. I solemnly charge you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. And he just doesn't have to start and say, okay, you boys, I want you to know, Timothy, Titus, I want you boys to preach the word. He says, listen, I want you to know this is a charge. This is a direct order from heaven. This is, this is a direct, you know, I'm saying this not as an opinion, but from the very presence of God, from himself, from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And by the way, he's the one we all have to stand before at the end. He's going to judge the living and the dead. By, by his appearing one day, we want to be found faithful. So if you want, to, you want to be found ready and right and holy and faithful before God when he comes, here's what you need to do as a pastor for your church, preach the word. Just preach the word. And that's so often the last thing that a lot of churches are, are doing. Now, the, the beauty of this thing is, is that when Timothy and Titus got this word, not all of the Bible had been completed in being written and revealed to us, conveniently bound in one nice little volume for us to take and study and to hold. It was still being developed. But what he's telling them is, you, you know, that what your responsibility is, that whatever else you do, first and foremost, the centrality of God's word is the primary thing. And, and I believe it's like Paul we could, uh, and we, if we want to duplicate this today for pastors that are being ordained in ministry, is simply you put a Bible in their hand and you say, this is your manual, this is the instructions, this is what you do, and this is what you proclaim. This is the word of God. This is your message. In fact, whatever the church does, we need to proclaim the Word of God in its entirety. There's a lot of churches like donut shops today who just look, preach the sprinkles, you know, the, 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 the sweet little part, the, the nice little encouraging word. But the Bible has much more say than just that little encouraging word. We need to preach all the Word of God. We seek not only to encourage, but exhort, rebuke, reprove. There's all those things that Scripture says to do. And we'll talk about what those words literally mean and how we proclaim the Word of God. But years before writing this to, in 2 Timothy, Paul had told the, the elders at Ephesus, listen, I did not shrink back, I did not shy away from declaring to you the whole counsel or the whole purpose of God. And that is a pastor's first and primary, foremost responsibility. That is the church's primary responsibility, is to preach the whole counsel of God. Now, a lot of people don't like that today. And, and our culture is, it really is opposed to that in, in general. But that is what God has called us to do. We're not to preach the latest psychology. We're not to, to preach and espouse the latest psychiatric lesson. We're not to, to, to espouse or, really, or preach even our, our feelings. Like, this is the way I feel about it. I mean, people are notoriously uh, uh, unstable, and that really offers no solution anyway. So we don't preach our feelings, and we don't preach really our human reasoning. 
We don't preach human intellect. It's flawed. It's limited. In fact, the Bible says if it's just knowledge, it just brings pride. It puffs up. But we're not even, really even called to preach good morals. The Bible has morality in it, so we're called to preach the Bible. Sometimes preachers are guilty of just getting up and making to-do lists. You know, don't do this, do this, do this, do this, and don't do this. And all you end up with is a bunch of people who think that because they've done something that they're right with God. Or, you know, you've heard me quote before, many, on many occasions, my mama said, well, my mama's not the final authority. Amen. And she'll tell you that. I'm not the final authority. The Word of God is the final authority in all matters of our life. And we preach this and we teach this. And again, if you sit in our 101 class, this is something that we reiterate and we emphasize that. Because the only thing that matters, the only real issue when it comes to us as the body of Christ is this. What does God say? What does the Bible have to say? His word is our only standard. It is our only authority. Now, you may be saying, well, Pastor Joe, come on. Isn't that obvious? Everybody knows that the Bible is the final authority for the church. Well, no, not everybody does know. And you'd be surprised how many pastors, I believe, are just ignorant of this truth. Not everybody knows it. Not every pastor knows it. And there's a lot of people, perhaps, who do know it in their heads, but they don't believe it in their hearts, and nor do they practice it in their churches. So for us to stand up and say, we preach the Word of God, we believe the Word of God, the Word of God is our foundation, it means not only that we would declare it, but that we'd also embrace it. There's a great illustration about a, a, a legendary baseball umpire by the name of Bill Clem. For all you baseball fanatics, you may remember Bill Clem. He was one of those guys who was, a, who was an umpire that was, had a lot of notoriety because, uh, especially in the 1900s, if you were an umpire, you might be taking your life into your own hands. You had to rule the game, and he did. In fact, he ruled the game with, with an iron hand, and he wouldn't allow the, the rough characters of those early 1900s to sway the game or sway his opinion. You know, he, he wouldn't let anybody intimidate him. One day, he was umpiring at a game behind home pl plate, and the, the runner came in, and he slides in, and, and then uh, you know, the ball comes flying at the same time. It was a very close play, I mean, right on the line. Clem was right there on top of the play, uh, but he didn't call it right away. He just kind of stalled and waited for a moment, thinking about it. Catcher stands up. He's out. Runner stands up. I'm safe, you know. Everybody's jumping around, declaring and yelling. Finally, both dugouts began to yell at the, at the umpire for Clem to, to make a call on the play, and he just kind of stood there for a moment. He studied this situation until someone finally roared at him, All right, Clem, make your mind up. Is he safe or is he out? which Clem responded, he ain't nothing till I say what he is. <laughs> Final authority. Hey, that's in a baseball game. In life, the Word of God is the final authority. We live by what the world declare, but the word declares, not what the world declares. We're living in a day and an age when everybody wants to declare their own play, their own way, their own ruling. But that's not so if we're going to be a child of God. It's not by what I feel is right, what I think is right, what I would, the rest of the world even says is right, but what does the Bible have to say? And the church's responsibility is to deliver the message. Kind of the way that the, in medieval days, the, the herald of the king would ride in on his horse to the town center. He'd unroll the scroll in hand, which listed the king's order or the king's dictates, and he would read to the village, Thus saith the king. And the people would respond to whatever the law was or the declaration was. That's the church's responsibility in much the same way, to roll out this scroll and to say, Thus saith the Lord. This is the final word on this issue. You can say what you want to say, argue it all you want to argue, but the final word is, it is what God says it is. It is, and of course I know everybody's favorite saying, well, it is what it is. Well, it is till God says it is. <laughs> and what you need to realize is that it is what God says it is, and to say, I want to know what the declaration of the Word of God is, because this is what God's called us to. And we cannot, as pastors, as a church even, shrink back from declaring the whole counsel and the whole purpose of God. Now, the thing about it is that we're not just preaching the morning paper. We're not just talking about some popular thesis of the day. This is the Word of God. Biblical preaching will confront people. It brings a change in people and men and women. Biblical preaching confronts men and women with God through His Word, inspired 
energized by the Holy Spirit, filtered through whatever personality of the pastor or pastor may be preaching it so that the church can understand and respond to the truth. All right? God uses people to declare the truth. God uses preachers to declare the truth. God says he's chosen the foolishness of preaching to reach those that are lost. God's chosen the foolish preachers to preach to those that are lost, all right? But it's still the power of the Word of God. And it's an amazing thing. It's not like re getting up here and say, well, here's what Einstein said, or here's what, you know, Darwin said, or here's what anybody else has written. This book has a divine author. This book, because it has a divine author, whose author is a spiritual being, is a, then this is a spiritual book. When we talk about the proclamation of it, it means, yes, that we, we proclaim it as teachers, as preachers, in your lift groups, in your Bible study groups, wherever we are. What are we doing? We are proclaiming the truth of the Word of God. We're reading it. We're explaining it. We're applying it. And we don't explain it with our particular thought processes. We explain it with what the Word says about itself, all right? Because when the Bible makes a statement, it reiterates that statement. And it's simple, and it's clear, and it's to the point. That's why I love Scripture, you know. I'm not a deep kind of individual. I love the simplicity of the Word of God. And the Word of God is so simple that if we preach it, if we're really preaching it according to the way it's written, every one of us can get a grip on it, no matter where we are in our learned uh, process, in our learning journey. It's just the beautiful thing of the power of the Word of God. And our responsibility is to preach the Word of God. And there's power in it. It's power in biblical preaching. So I think one of the first things we have to do is preach the truth. We hold it up. We tell people to read it. We tell people to believe it. We tell people to preach it because it is believable and because it is transforming, and because it is powerful. We don't want to just sit and talk about it. We want to apply it. We don't want to just look at it. It's kind of like looking at a pair of binoculars or, or, or a telescope laying there on the counter, you know. You don't just have them there to, to look at. They're there for looking through. And the Bible's there for looking through. When I, when I take a pair of binoculars and I look through them, those things that are far away are hard to see or hard to get a hold of, all of a sudden are magnified and become clear. That's the way the Word of God is. You want to get a glimpse of God? Look at His Word. It brings it into reality. It brings it into focus. Give you a little hunting tip for all you that are hunters in the crowd today. When you take your binoculars and you're scanning the woods for animals and for creatures, don't try to scan the front of the, the, the forest line. Take your binoculars, focus them on the farthest thing inside the woods that you can see, and I can guarantee you any animal walking around there is going to pop into focus before you would ever seen it before. The Word of God gives us that kind of capacity to focus in past what's in front of us and see the things that are eternal and see the things that are real and actually to see the things that are invisible. They become visible to us. That's why Paul says we don't look at eyes, you know, like with flesh eyes. We have spiritual eyes, and those spiritual eyes are brought into focus, and what they see and what they see through like glasses is the Word of God that God has given us. And there's power to change people's lives within that Word of God. The great danger we have today is that churches, they look at the Word of God, they don't look through the Word of God. We need to hear what God says. And it's not a matter of what the pastor says even. It's a matter of what does God say. It's not thus saith Brother Joe, thus says the Lord. The question is, do we look, far, do we look through the Bible or do we just look at the Bible? How often is the Bible just laid on the shelf in somebody's house and never responded to, never looked at, and therefore you never get a glimpse of God in your life? I love what Paul wrote to the, about the Berean churches in Acts 17. He, in fact, he called the people in Berea noble-minded. Why? Because when he went and he preached the word to them, it says they received it with great eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if what he was saying was true. They just didn't take his word for it. You know why the church is so confused today? We have a bunch of preachers and pastors who have no idea what the Bible says, and they get up and espouse their personal opinions about stuff, and people just say, okay, huh, okay, that's good. They're not noble-minded. And if we're going to be noble-minded believers, we'll listen to what the pastor says, but we just won't take his word for it. I mean, here's Apostle Paul, <laughs> and these guys are saying, oh, let me check that out. Let me check that out. That's the same kind of attitude that you and I need to have, that we're willing to look into the Word of God and say, well, what does God say about that? I hear what you're saying, but is that Scripture? Is that the truth? You know, I'm just going to not see, just take you at your word. I want to know what God says. Perhaps you, you've traveled some, and like me, I, I get to the airport, and I usually have my carry-on bag, 
And, you know, right there, before you get on the plane where they, you know, take your ticket and everything, uh, and, and the ticket personnel are to kind of check off your boarding pass and your identification and things, there's a, there's a metal frame there. You ever seen it? Yeah. It's about so big, about the size of your carry-on. Or at least it's the size your carry-on ought to be. It stands there and sits there like a standard. You're supposed to make sure that what you're carrying on the plane fits in that. Most don't, I know. But that's the way our culture is. We ignore standards. But there's one standard you're not going to be able to ignore and get away with it. You may be able to get your oversized bag in the overhead, all right? But you're not going to get away with God and ignoring His standard and what He says in His Word. He's given us what it is. It's not, you can't fudge, all right? You can't press the bounds out. It's already set and, and, and it's already recorded and it's already been given to us. This is what God expects. It is a fixed standard that doesn't budge. In fact, when you take your little carry-on up to that little metal standard there in this, in, at the airport, you can shove on it all you want. If it doesn't fit, it's not supposed to be allowed. Well, listen, our lives have been given a standard by God, which we can know. And this thing about it, it gives us security. These things are written that I might know that I have eternal life, that I can have peace, that I can know I can be, I can know I'm walking with God. I don't have to guess about it. How many people do you talk to? Are you going to heaven? I say, well, I'd like to think so. Excuse me. This is your eternal soul. Eternity's a, a long time. You think one school day's long? <laughs> Consider eternity. You think a work day's long? You think this year was long? There's no comparison. I think we better hear what God says and, 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 the, and receive it and embrace it. It's the Word of God, and it has the power to change lives. And when, when do we need to proclaim the Word of God? Well, I'm so glad you asked, because 2 Timothy 4, you get back to it, it contains another needed word to us concerning the church's responsibility that we've been given to proclaim the Word. He says to Timothy in chapter 4, we read from one, view the, the, the presence of God, the judgment that's coming, the return of Christ, all these things, preach the Word. He didn't stop there. <clears throat> Be ready in season and out of season. Preach the word. In season or out of season. Now, you're not talking about deer hunting. You can't shoot deer at a certain time of year, all right? In fact, the word season is a word which would translate more appropriately today's language to whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient. Now, as a young preacher, I had a pastor who would call me early on Sunday morning occasionally and say, hey, <coughs> why don't you come preach for me today? What? I'm not prepared. Oh, the Bible says be instant in season and out of season, Joe. And I'd go preach for him. He taught me a lot of important lessons as a young preacher. He'd call me on Wednesday afternoon, you know, I'd be doing something. Why don't you come preach for me tonight? Brother Jim, church starts in two hours. Yeah, but you're supposed to be in season and out of season. Now, that's good, and I think there's an application, but it literally means whether it's convenient or inconvenient. It certainly was inconvenient, so that applied in that situation. But the idea is not so much in the preaching being inconvenienced by having to preach it. It's you being inconvenienced by me preaching it. Whether you like it or don't like it, you need to hear the Word of God. The Amplified Bible says whether it's convenient, inconvenient, welcome or unwelcome, hear and preach the Word of God. So it doesn't matter really how people respond. He said, you preach it anyway, no matter what it is. And, and the Word is at any time and everywhere, no matter what's going on, you're ready to preach the Word of God, no matter what, convenient, inconvenient. Now, I know that has a lot of applications. But for a pastor, it means to preach the Word no matter whether you're sitting there smiling or glaring. No matter whether you're sitting there saying, I hate that Word, I don't want to hear that thing. And, and I know what it's like to hear sermons I don't want to hear. You know what it's like to hear sermons. What's going on. That's when it's inconvenient, isn't it? Come on. It's an inconvenient moment when if I don't want to hear it. It's an inconvenient moment if you don't want to hear it. You, we're, we're to preach it anyway. There's been a lot of times I've been in churches, you know, that, that people didn't receive it. Now, as a young preacher, I'm just so happy in Jesus, I thought everybody wanted to hear it. <laughs> uh, I remember I hadn't been preaching very long. The one preacher, I preached it. They asked me, can you imagine they asked me to preach at a convention of preachers? And I hadn't been preaching for about three years. So I went to all these preachers and I preached this sermon. Afterwards, some of them came and said, uh, uh, how, how, do you pre how can you preach like that? I, I kind of like, what? Don't you make people mad? I said, well, they get mad or glad. Amen. I, just, I didn't know there's another way to do it. I just thought you got up and, you know, he wrote it, we quote it. That's the way it worked for me. That's the way I thought we were supposed to do it. And, you know, so I had one guy said, he came to me, literally said, I need you to come preach that sermon at my church. I said, why don't you preach it? 
He said, they'll fire me. <laughs> he did. To which I said, you, you're a coward. You're a coward. Now, again, that wasn't real well received either, but <laughs> convenient or inconvenient. But, you know, the word is the word of God. And I think, praise the Lord, I was just stupid enough to do it to begin with, so I just developed a trait, praise the Lord. But the idea is that's the way it is anyway. I remember uh, in, in Tony Evans' book, he shares the illustration of George Beverly Shea. I mean, you know George Shea, he singer with the Billy Graham Association for years, you know, How Great the Art, all those songs. I'd rather have Jesus, he wrote that song. Just a great singer. He was at a business uh, meeting, a luncheon for the businessmen, and there were hundreds of businessmen there, and uh, the master of ceremonies noticed that George Beverly Shea was there. So he went over and he asked him, uh, uh, Mr. Shea, would you, would you sing a song for us here at the luncheon today? He said, well, I'd be glad to. He says, oh, but don't sing any of those gospel songs. <laughs> to which George Beverly Shea says, then I can't sing for you. You know, the only reason I sing, this was his quote, the only reason I sing is Jesus. Amen. That's, the only, that's all I've got to say. But people, they want to intimidate. Well, you know, the world, they won't like what you have to say. So can you say something different? I was in a revival service not too far from here in North Houston where a pastor literally took me into his office after the service and said, what do you think you're doing? He said, I'm preaching the Bible. This is a, a fairly large-sized church. What do you think you're doing? I said, you invited me here. What do you think I was going to do? <laughs> That's all I know to do. He said, you know, I'm going to lose my job if you, if you do this. I said, well, you know, I've been thrown out of better places. So. <laughs> been thrown into better places. <laughs> I said, you want me to, I said, I can, it's your church, I can leave. Oh, no, I don't know about that. Well, you know, you may have heard me share that story before, but he, he didn't show up the rest of the week for the revival. He suddenly came ill and couldn't make it back to church. But that's where the church is today. People are easily intimidated and pastors are easily intimidated so that they don't preach the word. In fact, there are seminars, you've heard me say it on multiple occasions, you go to as a young pastor, as a preacher of your church, and they'll tell you how to grow your church. And one of the things they make very clear is that you don't need to talk about sin and judgment and right, unrighteousness and use those kind of words and hell because those make people uncomfortable. And people don't need to be uncomfortable. People have a hard life. That's usually the way it's presented to pastors. You know, you're a, you're a man of God. You're there to encourage people. Listen, folks, there's nothing more encouraging than getting right with God, by the way. You're there to, you know, and what we end up with is donut churches and donut chefs for pastors. You know, who learn how just to get the right little sprinkle of stuff on there and make it taste good and it's sweet, but it's absolutely no good for you. And it doesn't make any difference in your life. God has called us to preach the Word of God. Why does He command us that way? I mean, it's, it's God's Word that tells us to do this. God commands us to preach His Word at all times because there is no season where God's people don't need to hear it. There's no point in your life you're ever going to get to, or I'm ever going to get to, where we don't need to hear the Bible. We just need the truth. It's truth that liberates us. It's truth that sets us free. It's, it's truth that changes our life. It's, it's truth that gives us hope. It's truth that gives us direction. In fact, if you're looking for a church right now, what you really need to do is, is if you want to find a church, then one of the good tests you ought to evaluate it by is that 2 Timothy 4, 2. Do they preach the Word of God, whether it's convenient or inconvenient? If you can find a church that will do that, you'll find a church that will help you when you may need it the most. You'll find a church that'll give you direction when you're looking for direction. You'll find a church that has a light on when you need light in your life. Otherwise, all you're going to get is donuts, sugar, and you may get a little high out of it. You know, we get a little sugar boost, a little sugar high. You, you know, you know, you don't feed your kids donuts before bedtime. Yeah. That's why I always love to see our children's ministries up there shoving don't, uh, kids candy in kids' mouth before they send them home to you. So you can see what I have to deal with in here on Sunday. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We get this sugar high and we get pumped up and, you know, then we're just a mess and we just don't go, we won't find any peace. It all looks good, it tastes good, but the results are not good for you eating donuts. A donut diet will kill you. All right? You don't need donuts all the time. He said, what's your responsibility? I love what Vance had a great preacher, one of the most quoted preachers in the world. He says, you know, he had it right when he says, our responsibility is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> because we need to be afflicted when we get comfortable. Because if we get comfortable, then we soon start backsliding. 
And we start getting a warped perspective of the, 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 the worldview versus God's view of the world. In fact, the Bible tells us we're to proclaim the truth of the Word of God in season, out of season, no matter what. We're there. It is the Word of God, and so we should be proclaiming it as the Word of God. He says, retain, in 2 Timothy 1, the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. God has given us a treasure, and that treasure is His Word of God, and we protect it. We protect it from the opinion of people, from the opinion of our culture, from the opinion of those who don't want to hear it. We will embrace the truth of the Word of God, and we're going to hold on to what God says. It is the treasure that God has entrusted us. So we proclaim the Word of God. How? We, we need to proclaim God's Word. Well, the apostle gives instruction, and, and again, in Timothy, when he writes and preaches the Word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So here's that. There's another verse I want you to look at right quick that goes along with this, and they're parallel together as to how we preach the Word of God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness. Go back and look at that other verse one more time. The, we preach the Word. What do we preach? The Word. And what will we do when we preach it? We'll reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. What we have is the Scripture. It's inspired by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. These verses kind of overlap each other to give us a general idea of, you know, of the need of, uh, and, and the way that the Word of God is, is proclaimed. There's a lot of words in, in both of those texts that really describe the effect the Word of God has on people's lives. It's not that you say, I'm going to rebuke. No, the Word of God will come as a rebuke sometime. I'm going to reprove. No, the Word of God will be a reproof. In fact, what might be a word of encouragement for you may be a rebuke for somebody else. I mean, isn't that amazing? That I can preach a sermon and somebody will walk out of here and they're just glad as they can be. The other person's just mad as they can be. So it, it, really we're talking about the effect here that happens and, and what happens in people's heart. And, and the Word of God is what we preach because it's the Word and only the Word, by the way, as he said here, it is the inspired Word of God. And if it is inspired, then it has the capacity to shape our life, to change our life. The Word has power. Why? Because it's inspired by God. These aren't the words of men. This is the Word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired from cover to cover. Now, I know you may be familiar with Baptist politics. There may be 25, 30 years ago, there was this ongoing war within the Southern Baptist Convention, and it was over this one issue. Is the Word the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God or not? Some held another belief. Well, the Word of God is inspired in spots, and we're inspired to spot the spots. That's not true. The Word is inspired from Genesis to Revelation. You say, how do you know that? Jesus declared it so. The Word of God declares itself to be so. It is infallible. It is the Word of God. It is set for all time. God's not going to change His mind. The idea of open theism, which is a popular theology today, that God's still kind of working things out, you know. He's not sure if homosexuality is wrong or not. You know, God hasn't figured that out yet. But He's going to let us know sooner or later. And, you know, if culture changes, then God changes. No, God, God is immutable. Yes. The Scripture describes God as immutable, which means that God doesn't change. If God is for something, He's been for, for it forever. God's against something, He's been against it forever. And if He's for something, He's going to be for, for it for the rest of forever. And if He's against it, guess what? He's not going to change His mind. That's the beauty of Scripture. It's something that we can embrace because it's unchangeable. It's inspired by God. In fact, since the author of Scripture is perfect, it's impossible for the product to not be perfect. The God of truth can only produce truth, and He's given us His Word. And we are to proclaim that Word just as that it is truth. That's so the fundamental answer to the question of how is the Bible to be preached and taught is that we are to present it just like that. It is truth absolute truth, without apology, without stuttering. It's just the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. It's the truth. So we proclaim it as the truth of God's Word. We don't back down from it. We don't say, well, well, my opinion is. No, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. What does the Bible have to say? Remember, early on, we start, we, when, in starting this series on the church, we said that the church is the pillar. You know, it's the support of the truth. What truth? The Word of God. You need to keep coming back to what Jesus even said in John 17, 17. Your word is what? Your word is truth. 
Truth. Truth. Truth. Well, guess what? Truth is what liberates. Truth is what sets us free. Truth is what changes us. Truth is what gives us a foundation. Truth is, is, is what we can embrace because it's not going to shift. It's not going to change. Therefore, we can have a sure and a certain hope because we are standing on the truth and nothing but the truth. It is the Word of God. And so we preach the Word of God as truth. Now, as I preach or you speak to others the Word of truth, what happens? God begins to move. And this is the, what happens when you preach the Word. The results begin to take place. In fact, the apostle began with the Word in this passage in 2 Timothy, 3, uh, 2 Timothy 4 about preaching and, repro and reproof. In fact, the Word is reiterated in 3.16 as reproof. He says, reprove, reprove. Now, what are we talking about when it proves? Well, it basically means to tell someone what is wrong, not with the idea of chastising them, you know, just to give them some kind of verbal whooping or something, but with the idea of seeing their life changed. Now, that's the Word of God. Only the Word of God, by the way, has the power to really change a life. It's that powerful. It's living. It's inspired. It's truth. It sets us free. It changes our thoughts. It shapes our life. It molds us to the very image of Christ Jesus. So we preach the truth of God's Word, and what happens? God begins to reprove folks and to begins to deal with their heart. You don't have to know what's going on as a preacher. I know some of you think I read your emails or check your phone calls or whatever. In fact, you know, I had one of the men at the other campus this morning said, you know, the last couple of weeks, you, you, you've been reading my mind. Are you psychic? Are you, what's the deal here? I said, I don't have to. All I have to do is take the Word of God. Remember, it is a spiritual book. And then the Holy Spirit takes these spiritual words, and He takes those words, and He puts them into your heart. And He begins to reprove if reproof is needed. It's an effect that He has this. And that's the beauty of the Word of God. I can know, you can know, when you speak the Word of God, something's happening in people's minds, and something's happening in their life. It's not the power a persuasion. It's not the power of the ability to, to, to shape people's thoughts, hearts, and minds. It's the power of the Word of God. So what happens when the Word of God is being preached and it's being held up as truth, then there's a reproof that comes. So all we have to do is preach the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit makes an application. And that's why, you know, you can be in here and, and, and you can be preaching about, you know, the tabernacle and somebody gets saved. <laughs> You can be preaching about giving and somebody gets saved. You, you, you can be preaching about something on the family and some other issue not even related to the topic will minister to somebody else because a word came through that sermon that went directly to their heart and directly to their life. So we reprove. He was also told, Timothy was, to rebuke when necessary. Now this is a, this is a different word that means to bring a person under, uh, under the conviction of guilt. You know, that they, they realize that what they're doing is wrong. And they, they, they're brought under conviction to, to get it right. And that's the Holy Spirit's job, ultimately. That if there's something in your life that's not right, God's going to bring it to your heart and mind as the Word of God is, 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 is being preached. I don't have to try to work up people's emotions. I, I don't have to try to play on your guilt, all right, to get you to somehow behave. And, and some preachers do that. But if I'll just preach the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will convict you. Remember in John 16, Jesus has just had the last meal the, with, with, with the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and he's telling them what's getting ready to go on. He's going to die. But he says, listen, when I go, another's going to come, the Comforter, and he will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In other words, he's going to tell you what's wrong, show you how to do what's right, and going to, you know, going to let you know there's, there's rewards or judgment for whatever you don't. All right? The Holy Spirit's ministry is to convince you that the Word is true. So as I preach, I believe it's a supernatural Word. We believe that we are supernatural and we are spiritual beings. The Word of God, which is the seed of God's truth, comes into our heart and begins to germinate within us, sometimes bringing reproof, sometimes bringing conviction, sometimes bringing correction. Sometimes it's an absolute rebuke that what we're doing is wrong. We need to get right with God. In fact, some people won't get right with God until the Word is preached. And God does a work in the heart. Paul used another term in, in, in Timothy that he called correction. And in fact, it's the only place in 2 Timothy 3 there, it's the only place that this particular word appears in the New Testament. And it means to correct means to restore something to their original condition. For those of you who don't know Jesus, the Word of God is preached because God wants to bring you back to that unfallen state, a new person regenerated in Christ Jesus. Adam had fellowship with God. He lost it because of sin. God wants to bring you back into a fellowship relationship with Him, make you 
you right, cleanse you of sin, make you his child, all right? For the believer, there's also this element of correction where we were walking with God, and then we started stepping out of his will, disobeying his word, going our own way, listening to the popular consensus of the world, what people thought and, and what they did, looking at them where they were and saying, well, I want that, and we stepped out of the will of God. And so the word of God comes to us at that point, and God begins to correct us, to bring us back to that right relationship. The goal of our proclamation ultimately is to lead people into relationship and fellowship back with God, restoring us to the original purpose that God intended to have with us, you know, reversing the corruption of sin in our life and death that it brings in our life, walking in victory. The next word he uses in 2 Timothy 4 is the word exhort. And although reproof and rebuke are, are negative, this term for, for to exhort is more of a word of encouragement. It's that, it's that where the Word of God comes and kind of puts its arm around your shoulder. I've been corrected, but now I'm going to be encouraged what the Lord wants me to do. And, and, and the thing about this is that it's, 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 its content uh, has content that's based upon the Word, not upon somebody just patting you on the back and saying, you know, you could do better. No, the content being the Word of God, remember the Word of God is spiritual and it's supernatural so that when I encourage you with the Word of God, it's more than just words coming into your ears and maybe into your mind. It's words that are going into your ear, to your mind, to your very soul and spirit where you're feeling the presence and sensing the, 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 uh, the, the grace, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the encouraging Word of God that is a living Word. And it's, it's a whole different level than somebody on the coach's sideline patting you on the back saying, you can do it, all right? This goes much deeper than that. It's where God begins to affect your mind, your will, your emotions, every aspect of your life. It is the powerful and the beautiful Word of God. It is God reaching in. The best way you'll ever be able to encourage anybody is when you start speaking the Word of God to them. That's why the Bible says, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The koinonia we dealt with last week had so much to do, remember, with, with sharing the Word of God and encouraging each other the Word of God. That is one of the ministries, and that's one of the priorities that the Word of God has. So we preach it, but we preach it with authority. Amen? The content of our rebuke, the content of our reproof, the content of our encouragement is found in those words of instruction in 2 Timothy 4 and the words teaching in 3.16. That's how we do these things that lead to these results in people's life. There are two forms of the same word, but the emphasis on what is taught, not so much the method of teaching. It's not how it's taught, it's the, what's being taught. And if we're teaching the Word of God, there's instruction. If we're teaching the Word of God, then there's, there's this real teaching that we need in our spiritual lives. But it's the Word of God. And if it's not the Word of God, it's not really teaching. It's just wasting time. It's verbal garbage. And there's a lot of churches that are doing that kind of teaching. They take the latest fad, the latest book, the latest psychology, the latest psychiatry, the latest how you can be happy sermon, you know, and, and, and preach that. One of those books that was, you know, your best life now. Y'all seen that book? I like what John MacArthur said about your best life now. He said, you know, if this is your best life now, you're going to hell. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we got a better life waiting for us, not our best life now. Our best life is when we were living with Jesus for all eternity. I'm just saying that what we're getting in the church today is donuts, not milk and meat, not the bread of life that we need to change our life. We need to be preaching the truth, and we need to be preaching with authority, believing God to, to, to minister to people's lives. What Paul wrote to Titus, he made it very clear. He says, you, these things you speak, and you exhort, and you reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Basically, don't let anybody intimidate you. The church's preaching must be done with authority. Why? Because in the Bible, we have the whole truth. The truth, the whole truth, and, and nothing but the truth. And you've heard me say before, how can you be so narrow-minded? It's easy when you're right. And if you're standing on the truth, you're right. So you can be narrow-minded because you're on the narrow way with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have the truth, and you ought not be intimidated by the rest of the world. You need to proclaim it with conviction. You need to proclaim it with authority because, you know, this is true. No preacher has to apologize for preaching truth. It may hurt our feelings at times. It may encourage them. But no matter what, whatever it does, the effect is, hey, we have this great treasure. We're going to embrace it, and we're going to preach it. The last point is this, what we, why we need to proclaim it. Why do we have to preach the world? With all, to preach the word with all this convicting power and all, and all this teaching power. Why? 
Because basically, as you, as you go back to that passage, as people need to hear, we're in that day that Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago when people turn away from sound doctrine. Teachers, they want. They want to have their ears tickled. They accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and turn away their ears from the truth, and they will turn aside to myths. In other words, the Bible says, if it's not Bible preaching, it's mythology. If it's not theology, it's mythology. And there's a lot of churches today who will get up and proclaim nice little devotionals that don't have anything to do with the Word of God. They may sprinkle a little Bible verse on top of it. Paul said, listen, we need to preach the Word of God more so now than ever because the time will come. Hey, if the time is coming, I believe the time is here. That's why we even need to be more specific about preaching the Word of God. Why do we need to preach it? People need to hear it. In fact, human nature is such that people get itchy ears. Human nature is such that we will gravitate towards people who will tell us what we want to hear. When you're living in sin and you don't want the truth, you're going to go find somebody who will agree with what you're saying. You want somebody to agree with you. You want, to, you want somebody to tell you what you want to hear. Well, you don't need to be on fire for Jesus. You don't need to be radical. You don't need to be, you know, all excited. You don't need to be in the Bible. You know, you know that's, 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 that's old stuff. And in fact, you know, if you listen to media today, you'd think that conservative evangelical Christians are worse than the jihadist terrorist. Wouldn't you? Are you Christians, y'all just radical crazy. Hey, say what you will, I'm standing on the truth. Amen. Do what you will, I'm standing on the truth. And when the judgment comes and we're all standing around, go ahead and praise the Lord. When the judgment comes and we're all standing around, I don't think ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or any of those ends are going to be standing around covering the story. They're going to be the story. And it's going to be judgment of life or death, sheep or goats. That's all it's going to come down to. And what's going to make the difference is those who receive the Word of God. Now, if all we care about as a church is just getting a bigger crowd here, then we can preach donut sermons and have a donut church. And people will line up to get their little fix of donuts. If all we're here for is to make people have a little shot of feel good and be happy about themselves, and you know, you, you can get that at any kind of donut church you want. They just glaze over the truth. And won't call people to account for their lives or their actions or their words. And the best results you're going to get from a, from a group of people will be a, a temporarily sugar high, but they're going to stumble and they're going to falter someday because they don't have what they need in their life. They don't have spiritual nourishment. They don't have spiritual nutrition, and their lives are going to fall apart. I love getting up on Saturday morning with my kids and going to the donut shop. All right? There's usually a line of people we'd have to wait on. I'd hate lines, but I'd still go to the donut shop with the kids. And they're all sitting around to get the little sugar fix, and we'd be there in line with them. In fact, have you ever noticed, I probably passed two health food stores coming. <laughs> There's never a line around them. <laughs> Is there? There's never a line around the health food store for some reason. Because people don't want healthy stuff. You know, we, we want to do what we want to do and live the way we want to live and, and have somebody kind of pat us on the back and say, you're going to be all right. In fact, this word for sound doctrine is a word literally in the Greek language that this, this means healthy. And people will not gravitate naturally toward that which is healthy. And that's why we as the church, as Believers Fellowship especially, has to make sure that there's one place where people are fed and they're healthy and they're given a balanced diet of truth as it's found in God's Word. And when they receive that truth, it transforms their very life. That's the important thing for us. The church's proclamation has to be the Word of God. And what is it the Word of God like? The Bible says it's like a mirror that when we behold ourselves. And a lot of times, folks, I've looked in this book and I have not liked what I've seen in myself. Sometimes we sit in church and we hear sermons. We don't like it because it exposes us to ourselves. And we'd rather sit back and judge somebody, blame somebody, you know, extract some kind of obscure meaning for why we've done what we've done. And the fact is, we're just sinners that need to get right with God. And God's the only one that can change our heart. And He's the only one that can change our life. That the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? Only God does. And when we begin to see a little bit of ourselves, we get frustrated instead of broken. What we need to do is just receive the Word of God. The Bible said receive it with meekness, humility. Let God speak to us. If Believer's Fellowship is going to be the kind of church that God wants us to be. It'll be because we keep on proclaiming the Word of God. Amen. Even in a day when it is less popular than it has ever been. 
And I know what some folks in this community who've been here a long time say about Believer's Fellowship. And I know what they say about me. But I don't care. Amen. I don't. I'm 104. Melanie's. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> I've come too far to care. Yeah. I've crossed too many rivers and jumped over too many hurdles and got too many scabs and too many failures to care about anything else. And I've seen too many successes. It's too close to the finish line for me to turn around and change my mind. And not because I'm old. That's just one reason. Jesus could come back is the other reason. And that's why Paul said, Timothy, I solemnly charge you by the Lord God himself and by his son Jesus Christ, who's appearing maybe at any time, preach the word. The instant in season, out of season. Don't be intimidated. Have courage. You as a Christian, preach the word. You as a Christian, live the word. Don't compromise. Don't settle for anything less than God's will for your life. Don't settle for anything cheap and tawdry and imitation, donut kind of church living. Be what God's called you to be. The only way you know that is I'm going to love this book and I'm going to embrace this truth. This is God's word. This is God's word. And that's when your life's going to be safe and secure. Outside that realm, you will be ravaged by the wolves of this culture. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed? I just want to make sure that we're holding up the word of truth for everybody to see.